Welcome in everybody to the Bare Knuckle Recovery Podcast, episode number 12. I'm Tommy Streeter, along with Nate Mollering, and it's been, well, it's like at least a month since we've been in here, right? Probably yeah. longer than a month. It's been 84 years. <laughs> you guys have seen the meme of the old lady from Titanic. Or if they've just seen Titanic. Well, some people have. Titanic is a great uh, metaphor for my life. So we're, today we're going to discuss what hap what really happened to the Titanic. No, mm -hmm. that's not what we're doing. Um, today we're going to talk about setting boundaries and why that's important. But before we do that, I have a shameful story to tell. Okay, tell the story. <clears throat> so I had to go to South Bend this morning at like 9 o'clock. Mm -hmm. So my alarm went off at 5 like it always does, and I didn't wake up to go to the gym. Mm -hmm. So I already started my day off on a yeah. bad note. So I went to South Bend, did the commercial, and I was driving back. And I didn't eat breakfast this morning. I had, oh, a, boy. I had a protein shake and some pineapple and a yogurt. Mm, right. So I was starving by the time I was driving back. So I stopped at the Pilot in uh, Plymouth on 30. And I got another protein shake, and I got a Rice Krispie treat. And then I was walking by. They got a bunch of, like, food there, like mm -hmm. actual food. Yeah. And I got a corn dog. Oh, Yeah. I got two corn dogs, actually. You know who loves um, food from gas stations is Jeff Ripley from the Hope and Recovery team. That's not surprising. He loves your roller dogs. So, like, the dogs, the, the hot dogs that are on those rollers that stay warm, he's like, oh, man, I could really go for a roller dog. And for the guys that don't know Jeff Ripley, he is a detective with the Fort Wayne PD who is on the Hope and Recovery team. Um, he looks like he likes gas station food. Yep. And he looks like a washed up hockey player, which I think he is. Yeah, so. that too. But, yeah, the corn dogs were not good at all. Yeah. So, well, we your lesson learned, okay? Yeah. We'll see you in about 12 hours if you get food poisoning. I didn't even eat gas station hot dogs when I was doing heroin. No. But I ate one today. Two today. And this time in South Bend, you didn't get shot in the head, right? No, I did not. Okay, good. Because that's happened to Tommy before in South own. Bend. He had, yeah. <laughs> well, the, you know, guns don't had, stop bullets, though. Uh, no, they don't. <laughs> but... So any that was my shameful story. It's very today. shameful. I'm it sure is. the audience is uh, going to ridicule you in the comments, as they should. Yeah. As they should. Rightfully so. You know, there's a thing called pro-social shame, which they talk about in the book Dopamine Nation. And this is the appropriate time for pro-social shame. I agree. That's yep. why I shared it. Okay. Well, we will shame you endlessly. Now, let's move on to the topic at hand, which is? Boundaries. Boundaries. So, and Tommy did not have good boundaries around his diet when he ate I did not corn dogs. Today. And later he may suffer the consequences of food poisoning. So I need just need to get some real food when we leave here to balance out the war that's going to we'll be go to Simple in Kitchen. my stomach. We'll go to Simple Kitchen. Sounds good. Sounds good to me too. We'll um, not a sponsor, but Simple Kitchen. In Fort awesome Wayne, food. next to OPS is great food. Noah, you ever been to Simple Kitchen? You got to check it out, man. Yep. It's way better than Taco Bell, I promise. Yeah. He said, no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So anyways, enough of this nonsense. Um, setting boundaries. You know, if you're a family member or friend of somebody who's in active addiction, setting boundaries with that person. Yeah. It's a really hard thing to do. It is. And I think at times for people, it seems nearly impossible, um, especially because boundaries oftentimes require the person to take a bit of a step back. Uh, and I know that's kind of a controversial thing to say. Uh, some people in the recovery community don't believe in taking a step back from your loved one. When they're struggling, they would say that you should remain supportive and not withdraw financial or uh, shelter. Um, but, you know, I mean, you can remain supportive while also not giving your loved one money and a place to live, though. I think the that, way that like our parents were supportive. Well, the way that our parents framed it to us, right, was that I will participate in your recovery, but I'm not going to participate in you killing yourself, which is active addiction. Exactly. And I think a lot of people, they, I mean, they struggle with that and rightfully so, especially mothers, because mothers, you know, brought us into this world. Um, they carried us for nine months. They birthed us. Uh, I, I think that is super hard. I see dads have an easier time with it. I will say here, here's what I see actually a lot of is the, I see that usually moms have a tougher time of it with their sons and the dads have a tougher time with the daughters yeah. stepping back. <clears throat> I um, agree with that. Yeah. Which, which makes sense. Um, so, I mean, it, it is a difficult thing, but I think we can talk a little probably about our stories and that will help people understand what helpful boundaries there were for us that were put in place after many years of manipulation mm -hmm. and uh, coming up with seemingly good stories that our families were believing 
not because they were stupid, but because you want to believe your loved ones. That's what I tell people all the time. Like mm -hmm. it was so easy for us to manipulate our parents and our loved ones because they just want to believe you so bad. Absolutely. So it makes sense. It does make sense. You know, you look, for, <clears throat> my parents would always say, you know, we thought you were using when you were telling these outlandish stories about what happened or why your eyes were bloodshot or why you looked like you were messed up, but you want to see the good in your child. You want to look for the good things. You don't want to, um, you, and you don't want them to be using, right? Yeah. I mean, you want them to be in recovery. You want them to be honest with you and you want it to be the truth. So with me, you know, let's talk about bad boundaries at first. So in my story, oftentimes my parents, with the best of intentions would provide me with cash. And they did that from a young age in high school simply because they'd be like, oh, you're gonna hang out with friends. You know, obviously you gotta do some chores, but here's 20 bucks to go hang out with your friends. So that was established early on, which there's nothing wrong with that if your kid is really using it to go out to eat with their friends or um, whatever they're doing, going bowling or something like that. But that's not what I was doing ultimately. By the time I got to high school, I was using that money for drugs. Uh, but obviously that takes parents a while to catch on, right? I mean, how many kids do we know that experiment? And some of that's just kids being kids. I mean, obviously we're big on prevention. We don't want kids to experiment with drugs, Yeah. but kids are going to make stupid choices and they want to find out for themselves. And so me, myself, I needed to find out for myself. Um, and I ultimately did. And it led me down a path that I didn't expect, but there became, wait a minute, you didn't expect right it wasn't your goal to become a no homeless heroin addict no you know like when i smoked weed for the first time or drank a beer with my friends in their parents basement it, i didn't set out to be homeless under a bridge mm. i didn't set out to steal my mother's jewelry i didn't set out to um Weird. have run-ins with the law i didn't run i didn't set out to owe people money that wanted to kill me um that wasn't my goal as a kindergartner when they asked me what i wanted to be in a rope well if it had been your goal you would have knocked it out of the park Maybe, yeah, in hindsight, it would have been a good choice. Um, you know, aim small, miss small, as they say <laughs> in shooting. Um, but yeah, so I thought I was going to be like a police officer or firefighter. I actually became the exact opposite. Uh, I became a criminal uh, as, as a career. You weren't a, a police officer or a firefighter, you were a police fighter. Yeah. <laughs> Which never went very well. No, um, not for me either. The police always win the fight for some reason. Don't understand that. But um, so, I mean, they sent me down this bad path, right? And and I think a lot of families don't necessarily want to believe it when they start to see the signs. Like I was meeting with a mother yesterday whose son is, you know, in his early um, adulthood, literally just became an adult this year. And, you know, she said that he was sleeping a lot. He became antisocial, started going out very late, lying to her. Things were adding up. Yeah. Um, money came up missing, you know. So, you know, initially she just thought it was kids being kids. And come to find out that he's now addicted to, you know, these perk 30s, which are actually fentanyl. Yeah. And I think, you know, when parents find that out, they are quick to try to curtail their enabling. They try to set boundaries. But again, loved ones are very good at poking holes mm -hmm. in our boundaries because they know it's best, right? Like they know what to say to mom and dad. And that's another thing. It's really important for the people in their life to be united in the boundaries. And that's one thing. That's a common theme we see a lot, right? Where maybe like mom is real solid, grandma's solid, brother's solid, but dad isn't. And dad always gives him 20 bucks. Yep. You know, and then everybody's like, oh, I don't know how Johnny ended up high again. You know, Johnny's not a real person. I'm just making that name up. But we don't know how Johnny ended up high again. That's because everybody wasn't on the same page. Yeah. So one of the worst things you can do when somebody who's in active use is give them, number one, cash, obviously, is the worst. But anything that has cash value that could be quickly flipped into cash, like gold, obviously. I mean, most people don't give their kids yeah, gold. Obviously, you shouldn't be giving your kids gold anyways, right. but... Yeah, it's not the 17th century, but, you know, I mean. You should be burying gold in your yard. <laughs> right. But, I mean, you know, the first things that are start that start to disappear is, like, the PlayStation 5, mm -hmm. the uh, the iPhone, <laughs> the, the MacBook, the laptop, um, signed memorabilia, um, expensive flutes, 
Um, These are all things that Nate stole from his parents and sold. Well, by no, the way. not the flute, but like <laughs> I, I just have a ton of examples because I've worked with my family, and then I also worked with a lot of other families. Uh, you know, like when things of value start to disappear, that's when you know there's a serious problem. And sometimes, if you can't get that person to adhere to a boundary, which again, cutting off financial support is vitally important early on. And a lot of people would say, well, what about rent money or what about food? I would say the number one thing to focus on first is not giving them cash. Then it's a good place to start, at least. If it continues and you still think they're using, then we go to rent money. And you say, well, they're going to end up homeless. Well, do you want them to continue to take the rent money you're giving them? Say you're paying the rent for them. You're giving them a safe place to use substances. Yep. And people would say, well, isn't that good? That's harm reduction because, you know, like then it's a safe area. Mm. That's not really the same. But there are safe places like the Fort Wayne Rescue Mission where you can be kept safe, but you are not allowed to use substances. And a lot of people say, well, what if I, as a boundary, I go over there and drug test them every day and look through their stuff? What is one thing we always say about that, Tommy, when family members or friends try to take that on? It's just not their role in that person's life. It's not their responsibility. They're, your parents, your friends, whoever, don't make good therapists, sober living managers, sponsors, recovery coaches. That's just not the role that you're supposed to play in that person's life. And I get, like, my mom absolutely would have been willing to do that, and I'm sure 100%. your mom would have been willing to do that, Both too. Both my parents were. But what does that do to them also? It, it, it hurts the relationship, but it also puts them in a heightened state of anxiety. Mm -hmm. It's traumatic because every time they find out you're lying to them, it damages the relationship. Every time they find out that you're um, doing something that's potentially harmful to you. And I think a lot of people who don't have children who are younger in recovery don't really understand that feeling a parent gets when they know their child is harming themselves with something that they provided yeah. them with yep. as far as giving them the monetary ability to obtain these things, right? Or even a place to stay, like a comfortable, safe place to use. Right. Like it, and you know, I didn't realize this at the time, but my mom always told me like, I'm not gonna put a roof over your head if you're gonna live here and you're gonna yeah. get high. Like if you're getting high, you're not gonna live here. I'm not gonna find you overdosed on the floor again. Yes. But then but her giving me a place to stay with, you know, there's a bed there, there's a refrigerator full of food there if I decide I want to eat something. Like all those things are just making it a little bit easier for me to keep doing what I'm doing. Well here's what I would say. It's okay to start there. So here, with boundaries, it's okay to start with them on a soft level and move it to a harder level. Right. Like it's okay to go from, okay, look, we're not cutting off your money yet, but we need you to get clean and they don't get clean. Okay. We're not going to give you any more money. You can live here and you can use our car for a job, but if you keep getting high, that's going to go away and they keep getting higher, drunk, whatever it is. And then you take that away. You don't have to take it all away at once. And that's what people think. Oh, well it has to be like black or white. Either I kick them out and never talk to them again, or I just let them have everything. Yeah. Start setting boundaries. And when they break a boundary, you have to move the goalpost. You have to keep reinforcing those boundaries consequences. How many times have we seen it where we go to talk to somebody who's living with their family, whether it be their parents, their grandparents, their wife, their husband, um, a friend, and they don't think the person is serious when they tell them, hey, I can't do this with you anymore. You're going to have to leave if you don't stop getting high. They're like, yeah, you've said that 20 times. Yep. That's not true. Or they know the game. They won't, They usually won't even come out and say that. They'll start running game on them, right? Well, how come you're going to make me homeless? Well, why would you do that to me? I thought you loved me. Like, well, you know, I'm trying really hard. Yeah. Well, what about you? How come you had a beer the other day? Yep. You know, well, you smoke cigarettes and nicotine's a drug. And then people are like, oh, yeah, he's got a point or she's got a point. Oh, you know, no, like you don't have to continuously subject yourself to abuse. And that is abuse. Somebody yeah. lying to you is relational mental abuse. Yep. I abused my family. I used and abused my family. I used people like I used my dope. 
I used them to make me feel better. I used them to get what I want. At some point, you got to say enough's enough and start taking those things away. Not necessarily even people think like that consequences are necessarily a punishment. They're not necessarily a punishment. Sometimes it's just important for that person who's the loved one to take control for themselves. Because what happened to your family's physical and mental health before they cut you off? Oh, it dwindled daily. Yeah. It drove them crazy. Yep. Right? Yep. Especially, especially your mom, right? Especially my mom. Tortured her. Yep. Day and night. And I did the same thing to mama. Mama would always say, Nate, I don't sleep because every hour or every two hours, whatever it is, I wake up and I come into your room and I put my hand on your back to make sure you're still breathing. Now, protecting life is always very important. But at some point, you cannot continuously put yourself through that. And I'm not just saying like the first time you find out your loved one is using drugs, you kick them out of the house and you're done with them and you call them a, a drunk, a junkie and, you know, you, you wipe, wipe, you take all their pictures down and they're out of the family. You know, like we're not talking about going nuclear right away. I'm talking about when you've had a conversation with this person and told them repeatedly, this really bothers me. Well, and I mean, usually this, these things are going on for a long time That's what before I'm we get a call. And then we're the ones having the conversation with these parents or the family mm -hmm. members or whoever it is. And like, yeah, you know, this has been going on for five years. And like, all right, yeah, you tried setting maybe some softer boundaries. You said that you said you were going to do this. You asked them to stop doing this. Like it's time to set some firm boundaries. Like that's usually the conversation that we are having with somebody by the time it gets to that point. But for people who maybe haven't been dealing with it for a long time, I agree with what you're saying, like setting softer boundaries right. at first and trying to do it that way. But the whole time I've just been thinking is like, by the time somebody gets to us, like, it's like, all right, it's to, right. Like, like what my mom and dad would always say, if I had, you know, if I'd gone to treatment and completed a program and came home and ended up relapsing at some point, which I always did, as soon as they found out, like it, that was it. Like, you're gone. You're not right. going to stay here. Like, you know, all the stuff that they had already seen by after the first time I went to treatment in 2014, right. like after that, like that was it. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, and it wasn't like you have to leave right now, get out of my house. It was, you can either go back to treatment or yes. you can leave my house. Right. So, and I always thought, like you said, they're making me homeless. Now I chose to leave. Yep. I could have chosen to go to treatment and do that whole thing. And then maybe come back home later right which wasn't always the best idea obviously but that's that's how i perceived it at the time was right. that they were making me homeless but you i was given a choice victim. you were a victim yeah i was given a choice right and i if i chose to leave then i chose to leave you shouldn't like the choice <laughs> i did not and that's what we tell people is when you're going to confront your loved one with this whole you got to get out or you got to get clean thing um and clean is different for everybody right like some people they get on mat yeah. like suboxone and they live a normal life yep you know whatever it is uh, but usually we always say present them with options that are going to help them but if they choose not to accept it they can't stay there yep and that's fine and like i would always say what you're what you said you oh you're going to make me homeless my parents would say nope you're choosing to be homeless there's a place you can go that has food that has a has a warm bed for you people that care about you and you can go there, but you can't stay here. We hope you go there, but if you don't, you're a grown man. That's up to you. Yep. You go do whatever you think you want to do. And we, we love you. And that's the thing. Like you don't, when you, when you tell people that you're done and you take the financial support away, you take the car away, take the phone, can't live with you anymore. That doesn't mean when they call you, you don't like, you can't pick up. It, some for some people you can't like you, you just know for your mental health you can't but i think it's always important to tell that person you love them and you're there for them if they decide to get sober yeah absolutely and but that doesn't mean what well, well that doesn't mean that when they get sober you have to welcome them back into your home immediately you can say you need to be sober for a year yeah or what our parents said to us was like, yeah, you're sober, but you got to go find somewhere else to live. <laughs> yeah. Like you can't just stay here forever. You know, yeah. it was a little too late for and, us. And the reason it often doesn't work for people to just move home when they get sober is because then that puts the family into a sober living manager situation, yep. a sponsor situation. Well, not only that, officer. but especially like if, if somebody is in the situation that I was in where 
all I had ever done at my mom and dad's house was gotten high or right. been dope sick. And I walk in that door and immediately that euphoric recall kicks in and I either am craving really bad right now. There was times where I would just, this is a true story. One time after I left treatment down in Indianapolis and I came back home and um, it was a house that my mom and dad hadn't lived in for a super long time. So I didn't live there for a really long time. But when I was there, I was either detoxing on the couch or I was getting high in my room. So I go into the room in my bedroom and lay down on the bed and the smell of the sh not that they smelled bad, like they were clean, but just like the smell of that house, the my bed, the sheets on my bed, it like immediately, like the last time I was in that bed, I was dope sick. And I like started getting all sweaty, like got super anxious. And I was like, I cannot be here. <laughs> so that's another thing too. It's not always great to go right back home, especially if that was somewhere that you did use previously. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, like you said, the euphoric recall, people always say, well, I'm going to go home and I'm going to stay sober. Sometimes you got to find a new home. Yep. And for a lot of people, that new home is a sober living environment where people can hold them accountable, mm -hmm. where their only job is to hold you accountable. It's not to be your friend, not to be your mommy, not to be your dad, not to be Graham Graham, not to be your uncle or your wife or your husband or your kids. And it's, I mean, it's really helpful to be in an environment like that where you're surrounded by peers who are trying to accomplish mm -hmm. a similar goal. It is. The opposite of addiction is human connection. Yeah. Knowing that, because if I go back to my mom and dad's house, like I'm, and we've talked about this before, you yep. say it all the time. If I go tell my mom that I feel like getting high today, like she's going to freak out. She yep. doesn't know what to do. But if I tell you, like, man, I'm having a rough day. I feel like getting high. Like, we're going to sit down and talk about it. Yep. Like, what's going on? Like, I, you know, so. We're going to go have coffee and smoke some cigarettes and talk about it. <laughs> Eat some chocolate. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's exactly what we should do. Minus the cigarettes part. Wow. You know, one thing at a time, Tommy. Um, no, I'm just kidding. We don't smoke. Um, I only smoke when I'm on fire, which is not very often. <laughs> um, so, honestly, I mean, that's... People always say that they don't know what to do. They don't know what the next right boundary is. They don't know what the next right move is. There is no perfect playbook for dealing with somebody in your life that struggles with substance use disorder yeah. or alcoholism. There is not. You do the best you can with the information you have at the time. That's one mm -hmm. thing Margaret Coates taught me is she would say, you did the best you could with the information you had at the time. And sometimes mistakes happen and and uh, it doesn't work out the best, but you you reformulate, you go back to square one, you, you try to start to make a plan and you go from there. And I think for a lot of people, they just become exhausted by taking on all these different roles for their loved one. Yeah. And I think that's one thing families have a really tough time of letting go of. And people say to me all the time, well, if I don't let them live in my house, then they're going to die out there. At least in my house, I can keep them alive. And you may feel that way for a little while. And look, we are all for harm reduction. So I am absolutely in favor of making sure people have Narcan, making sure people have access to, there's a 1-800 number. Um, where you can call and you know use use your drugs and they'll stay on the line until you become unresponsive. They'll send first responders to your location. But as a family member, that is not your responsibility. And we have never seen somebody be able to keep someone alive indefinitely just because they're in their home. What ends up happening is, and we've seen it so many times, yeah. that a loved one finds the individual that struggled dead in their house and they're never the same. And they have to, and sometimes they sell their house. Sometimes they try to live in the house, but finding your loved one like that is just something that you'll never forget and will haunt you to the end of time. And it's not your fault. If that person decides not to take the help that's given, doesn't get sober, doesn't get into recovery and they go out and they pass away. It's a terrible thing, but it is not your fault as a family member. Yeah. Never has been, never will be. Yeah, I'm not, and that's one of the things that my mom always said, like she was very confident that I was going to die of a heroin overdose, <laughs> as was I, as was right. everybody else that knew me. Um, and she decided that when that happened, she wasn't going to be the one that found me. Right. She'd done that before. She was like, I'm not doing it again and I'm not going to let it happen in my house because if I let it happen in my house, I'm never going to be able to forgive myself. Well, yeah, so that's huge for the parents. But one thing that a lot of people have to understand is sometimes other people live in the house. Yep. If you're too. a spouse and you have children, mm -hmm. those children didn't ask for that. They didn't ask. First of all, they didn't ask to be born. 
Second of all, they didn't ask to be born to a parent that has alcoholism or drug or drug addiction. I'm not blaming that person with alcohol, alcoholism or drug addiction. A lot of people say, well, it's not a moral failing to have alcoholism or a drug addiction. It's not. But what becomes a moral failing is when you know there's a better way, you know what you're supposed to yeah, do and you, you refuse, refuse to, to do, do it and you make everyone else around you suffer. That is a moral failing. Yep. Not saying you can't recover from it. Not saying you're a bad person. People are like, well, you're, you're, you're judging them. I'm not judging them. I am simply making a factual observation that you know a different way to live. You've been presented with help and an opportunity, and you refuse to take it. And yep. you can say all day, well, it doesn't work for me. I can't. I don't like that program. It doesn't work. Well, that's weird because I've seen 20 other people go through that program and stay sober and stay in recovery. And if it really doesn't work for you. Find a different one. There's a lot. It, it's on you. We have Google now. You don't have to jump on the yellow pages like you have Google. Google is more reputable than it used to be. You still have to be very careful, but you can find a lot of free programs out there. There are free programs. There are programs you can pay for if you're blessed, you know, and you have the have the financial means or if you have insurance. But if you don't reach out to somebody who can help you navigate. And that's what we do at Bare Knuckle, help you navigate getting on state insurance, federal insurance, whatever it is, or finding you a free program. And if you're a loved one who doesn't know what to do, reach out to us and we'll help you with boundaries. We'll help you give that person options, the best options that are available. And we'll walk with that person through those options. And we'll even come in person and talk to that person and try to get them to do something. You know, people always say, if you want to, if you want something different, you got to do something you've never done before. Uh, but what was people in recovery is was me. Sometimes I just had to keep trying to do what I was doing that I just never actually succeeded at. You yep. know, like I used to say all the time, well, the 12 steps don't work. Well, now I go to 12 step meetings and they work, but that's because I put in the effort now. Yep. So if you have somebody that that's living with you, that's struggling with recovery, <clears throat> it, it's okay to ask them how things are going. It's okay to tell them that they need to go to a meeting. If I'm being a dick at home, my wife says, I think you need to go to a meeting. I think you need to go call your sponsor. And that's not off base. It happens like every day. It does. I need a lot of help. But uh, <laughs> I'm going to message bare knuckle later. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. You're going to talk to Zach this week. All right. Man. Zach can help me. We're bold. We're brothers united in boldness. There you go. We have a common bond. Um, no, but I mean, this isn't easy stuff. And anybody who sits on a podcast or a talk show uh, or a TikTok account or Facebook and tells you that, you know, these are all the answers. If you do one through five or A through C or A through D or A through E or A through F, X, Y, Z, then this person's going to be fine and your relationship's going to be happy. They're full of crap. Like you don't know. And for a lot of people, family members setting boundaries, at first it doesn't seem to work because the person's going to rebel. Yeah. And they're really going to push you and they're probably going to push you more than they've ever pushed you before because you're bringing something new to the table. One thing we don't like as addicts is change. You know, it's almost like all addicts are Republicans. We hate change. <laughs> we fight against it vigorously, you know, um, and that's not a shot at Republicans. I'm just joking around. But uh, it, we all fight against it vigorously. Right. So when you change and you're not the person who's handing them 20 bucks anymore, they're going to say things to you they've never said. Yep. And they're going to be some vile things. And again, remember, now that person is making a choice. They have to take responsibility for those things. But part of that is also the addiction talking because the addiction comes to us in our own voice and it's insidious, which means it's evil, but it's subtle, right? It, 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 it is very manipulative to us and everyone around us. The person that is being manipulated the most by that addiction is the person that has the addiction. And oftentimes that's what's coming out. It's almost like they're possessed by a demon, you know, and it's like lashing out to try to get what it wants. Um, so be prepared for that. Be prepared for pushback. But that's why it's so important to have people in your corner like us who can deal with that person. But then also people for yourself, like we've had Jen Hope on here before, yep. the mom of an addict which is a support group for people whose loved ones um, struggle with addiction. And it's people who rally around each other. And it's, it's almost like, and it's almost like a support. Well, it is support meeting for people whose loved ones struggle, but 
addicts and alcoholics, we have our own support groups we're supposed to be doing. If you have a loved one, you have your own stuff you need to be doing. Yep. Fort Wayne Recovery also has some great meetings that's run mm -hmm. by their clinical director, Katie. And then Jerry who and Bonnie has also Uncle, been on the show. Who has also been on the show. So there's a lot of great resources here in Northeast Indiana. And if you're from a different part of Indiana or Michigan or Ohio, wherever the heck you're from, and you don't know, message us and we'll try to get you some resources. Yep. But boundaries are hard. And uh, we don't expect anybody to watch this video and then become perfect at setting boundaries. You know, our families weren't perfect. They, they weren't. But had they not set the boundaries that they did, I don't know if about you but i absolutely would not be sitting here today. there's not a doubt in my mind i would have died in my mom and dad's house if they would have let me keep getting high there giving me 10 20 bucks here and there i absolutely would have overdosed in their house and they would have found me if my parents hadn't kicked me out i would have continued to steal from them because they had stopped giving me money i would have stolen if it wasn't nailed down it was going yep going to the pawn shop my mom used to hide her like debit cards mm -hmm. in random places throughout did it the work? house. I normally found them. Exactly. You can't, it's <clears throat> hard for people to understand the tenacity. I'll look for that thing all day. <laughs> the drive. I don't have anything else going on. And that's why we tell people all the time, <laughs> dude, if you can just put 50% of the effort you put into getting high or drunk that you mm -hmm. get into your recovery, you're going to be a rock star, man. Yep. If you can take 50% of that and turn it into being an entrepreneur, watch out. You'd be the next Bill Gates, <laughs> the next Steve Jobs, you know, or uh, who's, who's Elon Musk, right? You know? Yep. But a lot of people um, don't end up doing that, you know? Uh, I used to walk rain, sleet, or shine. Like, I was a, I was a damn postman, you know, like from the freaking federal post office. Rain, sleet, or shine, that's their motto. And I was I was a drug addict just like that. I went out in a blizzard one time, drove my car, everything was shut down, and I went to Plato's Closet, which which was a store that bought used clothes and was gonna get probably 20 bucks to try to go get high, and I got there and they were closed. But I still found a way to shill those clothes to somebody, I don't remember who, and if you're watching, I'm very sorry. Um, <laughs> I'll give you your 20 bucks back. <laughs> um, but I, dude, I went out in a blizzard. I risked my life literally just to get a hit of dope. Oh yeah, I did that you know? numerous times. Yeah, me too. So, all right, Tommy, what else you got to say? Anything about boundaries or active addiction? I mean, as far as boundaries goes, I think we covered the majority of what I wanted to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, but real quick, if we do end up doing the podcast next week, one of the things that we'll probably talk a little bit more about is um, June being Men's Mental Health Month. Yes. So we got our own month. Right. Um, not to say that all everyone's mental health is important. Obviously, right. it is. But I think there is a little bit of a difference. Um, you know, women are a lot more willing to ask for help. Yeah. They're a lot more willing to admit when something is wrong mm -hmm. or when things aren't going well. And for men, obviously, for a long time, you know, we were told, you don't talk about that, you know, bottle it up, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And we see where that's gotten us as a mm -hmm. nation at this point. But yeah, um, just something that I think is important for you know us to talk about at some point yeah i mean there's a lot of young men that are struggling out there with mental health yeah um and that's and it's okay to talk about it like you don't have to is. bottle that up and act yeah. like it's not a problem because you think you, you you need to be tough and not talk about it right i mean like i think a lot of kids watch tv shows and they see people just you know they take it out by beating the crap out of somebody or sleeping with a bunch of random women um that's not really a healthy way to cope not really. You know, or doing much drugs or alcohol or, you know, like they watch the show Vikings on Netflix and, you know, those people, you know, they used to split people's heads open with yeah, swords. I mean, not, they're not the best. Their role mental models. health was clearly not good because they were slaughtering each other. Mm -hmm. um, but in today's society, there are very civil ways of dealing with our mental health and aggression. And I know Tommy's very excited. His favorite part of mental health month, it, men's mental health month is all the free prostate exams. He goes for one about every day just to make sure. <laughs> Everything is okay. I don't think that's mental health. That's more physical health, isn't it? Well, you know, like w when when your physical health is failing, your mental health is ailing. <laughs> so, um, Tommy's taking full advantage of the free prostate exams during mental health. Speaking course. of that, we got to get going because <laughs> it's almost time. <laughs> and the clinic's about to close. <laughs> <laughs> no, we 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 kid, we kid. But yeah, so we will talk about. Uh, men's mental health next yes, week men's mental health and next uh week. we're excited about that and then at some point we're gonna have dr scott myers on yes later this month um who else we got coming up tommy that's it right well actually we need to have jeff ripley 
Oh, um, Jeremy. Whatever, yeah, Jeff and Jeremy from the Heart program, and then either Sam or Darcy or one of you. I don't know. Yeah. We'll have them all on at some point. My guy, Jared White, wants to come on, too. He started, uh, I think it's at Fort Wayne 22. Um, he's a combat veteran, Marine Corps. Um, and there's 22 veteran suicides a day. So he started that for Fort Wayne, which is really cool. That um, is. Solid guy. Um, I think that we should have Gerardo back on again. He's always got lots to say. Mm -hmm. So we've got quite the lineup of people. Um, you know, there's always people that we think about. I think John Humphreys would be a good one. Maybe John Humphreys and Cody Knuckles. They're doing quite a bit of speaking in central yeah. Indiana. Really good guys doing some prevention work, telling great stories. Yep. We just have to hope that we're able to. Yeah make time we uh we have day jobs um and that quite often interferes with um the podcast day job is basically doing what we talk about on the podcast so yep all right well that was it man well hopefully we'll be back next week um so like always thank you guys for liking the page following sharing our content and again um, i made a post last night saying if anybody has any topics that they would like us to discuss always feel free to comment or message us and we'll be happy to talk about them as long as they are appropriate for the show so yep all right that's all i got thank you guys all right all right